Okay, we're doing great. So far, we've covered a great deal of important topics. We learned about the role of strategy, about the purpose of a company's goals, mission and vision statements, about the different stages of the industry lifecycle model, and about Porter's Five Forces framework. That's awesome! In this lesson, we will reinforce what we've learned about Porter's Five Forces model by applying it in practice. Our task will be to analyze the global sportswear industry. So, let's get started. The sportswear industry is a mature market that shows no signs of decline. People need clothing and love wearing sports apparel in their free time, both outside and at home. In the last few years, the industry has experienced a steady growth, and the total market is expected to reach $180 billion by 2020. Globalization, economic growth, favorable fashion, and style trends play a positive role for the current growth the market is experiencing. So, if we have to imagine the industry life cycle graph we saw earlier, the industry is in this phase right here, where the market is still increasing, but the industry is in its mature phase and the companies in it are profitable and generate stable cash flows. The pie is still growing and most companies are happy. Right. Let's take off our rosy glasses now and look at the competitive environment in the sportswear industry, shall we? As you remember, that's the force at the very center of the Five Forces model. These are the companies competing in the industry. There are a few names recognizable at a global level. Nike, Adidas, Asics, Under Armour, Puma, and Lululemon are some of the bigger firms out there. Nike and Adidas own several other notable brands that you've probably heard of. Nike owns Converse, while Adidas owns the Reebok brand. There are probably thousands of other smaller firms competing at a local level. Proof that the industry is not concentrated is in its concentration ratio. Previously, we learned a concentration ratio of the first four players in an industry of over 80% means the industry is highly concentrated. Well, this is not the case for the sportswear market. The combined share of the top four players in this chart accounts for 38% of the total industry turnover. The two global giants in this industry are Nike and Adidas, with a market share of 20.1 and 12.4% respectively. ASICs and Under Armour complete the top four list, but have a significantly lower amount of sales, 2.7% and 2.6% of the total market. The fragmentation of this market and the presence of a few global giants mean the other competitors can compete with established global brands at a local level only. As with any mature market, brand names and marketing efforts play an important role, and smaller companies cannot keep up with the level of investments Nike and Adidas can afford. There isn't a price war in the industry, as the two top players offer differentiated products sold at a premium, compared to the goods sold by local producers. The driving force in this competition is brand recognition and quality perception. The threat of new entrants is relatively low. A new competitor isn't likely to intimidate established players. Nike, Adidas, Asics and Under Armour have invested billions of dollars in marketing communication. Their brands are global. Therefore, a new entrant with significant ambitions must spend a lot of money to compete in the market. In addition, the new company must invest in human capital in terms of designer teams, production personnel, and other employees who have the necessary know-how for the creation of sports apparel sold worldwide. Not an easy task, right? So, the barriers to entry are significant if we consider the global market. However, new companies will have a much easier task if they want to compete at a local level. Local competition requires limited amounts of resources and, usually, it is much easier to access existing distribution channels at a local level. If a company aspires to be a global player, perhaps the way to do it is by entering a smaller niche of the market. This requires a smaller investment and allows targeting a specific need of customers. We will explore this topic further in the marketing module of this course. But it makes sense from a strategic perspective too, right? Do not attack large and established companies with a full-scale attack, because this is too difficult to organize and finance. Instead, as a new competitor, Target a particular market segment of customers and try to win a significant market share there. Okay, great. What about substitute products? Are they a big threat to the sportswear industry? Yes and no. There will always be demand for casual sportswear attire. 
However, changing customer tastes and styles may influence this demand in a negative way. Sportswear is trendy. Who knows if 10 years from now this will continue to be the case. Obviously, other clothing items are a valid substitute for sportswear clothing, but for now, there isn't significant pressure coming up from this force. Right. The remaining two forces we must examine are the bargaining power of suppliers and buyers. Let's start with suppliers. The main raw materials purchased by sportswear producers are cotton, other types of fabric, ethylene, synthetic materials, and rubber. Larger companies, like Nike and Adidas, can obtain cheaper prices from suppliers, which translates into a better cost structure compared to competitors, such as Under Armour, who buy smaller quantities of these products. So, smaller companies may have a harder time sourcing raw materials at a price that is competitive. One way to circumvent this issue is by using alternative fabrics, which means also coming up with an innovative product. The number of suppliers in the industry is relatively high, Therefore, we can conclude this force isn't creating too much pressure for companies operating in the industry. What about the bargaining power of customers? Given this is a business-to-consumers market, where end customers are millions of people, we can say customers cannot negotiate prices. However, it is also true that there are thousands of firms operating in the market. Customers know they have plenty of choice. So, right now, the brands established as global players have differentiated their products to create products of high quality and invest heavily in brand recognition. Companies understand this is a market in which the connection between sports fans and sports stars is strong. Recently, Nike signed a $500 million lifetime contract with LeBron James, one of its most famous testimonials. By creating branded products, market participants differentiate their brand and relate to the outstanding sport achievements of their testimonials. Turns out, the main driving force in the client-firm relationship in the sportswear industry is perceived value and brand recognition. Okay, so in summary, we can say the sportswear industry looks very good at the moment. Established brands like Nike and Adidas do not face too much competition at a global level. They have a good relationship with both suppliers and clients and are not threatened by substitute products and new entrants in the near term. This will do for now. We provided a holistic analysis of the sportswear industry. This is how we apply Porter's Five Forces framework in practice. An awesome exercise, wasn't it? Thanks for watching.